Before we get into working with vectors, it would be nice for demonstration purposes if we could draw lines in the game world in a very simple way, just doing so from code without having to add game objects and all that. And we can do that with the debug.drawLine method where you pass in a starting point, an end point, and then a color. So here we have two vector threes, A and B. And this first call to draw line is drawing from the origin. That's what this is, this is zero, 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 to point A, to vector A. And we're making that line green. And the second call, we're also drawing from the origin, but this time to B, and we're making it red. So let's play the game. And you can see here, the lines are being drawn, but only in the scene view. And that's because these calls to debug.drawLine, they're considered so-called gizmos. They're not really rendered elements of our game. They're there in our editor for visualization and editing purposes. And so that's why by default, they're not showing up in the game view. But I can enable rendering of gizmos in the game view if I click this button. And so now they're showing up in the game view. It'll also be really nice if we can draw information and some basic controls on the screen rather than relying on the console for spitting out all information, which is a little clumsy in many cases. So we wanna add some HUD elements. And the way we do that in Unity, there's actually an old system and the new system. The old system is called the GUI system, AKA the IM GUI system, as an immediate mode system. This is legacy, it's kept around for compatibility with older games, uh, but it's also what is used by the Unity editor itself when it draws the little windows and elements of the editor. And in fact, if you want to extend the editor, you can do so. And when you do, you use this old API to create those interface elements. Aside from those cases, it's still sometimes nice to use this old MGUI system uh, for quick and dirty prototyping, for putting debug info on the screen and basic controls on the screen, like say a button, but we don't really care how it looks like or if it's positioned precisely in the right spot. The old system is nice for this because we can very quickly do so with just a couple lines of code. We can put an individual element on screen. For more complex stuff and for things that we want to make look good, you want to use the new system, which has more options for layout, for styling, and also I've seen claims that it's more efficient, that this old system had some efficiency issues. But the way you use this new system is you create game objects with certain components, but particularly for prototyping and, and quick debugging purposes, it's often more convenient to uh, add these elements from code. And so here's how we can use the old IM GUI system. There's a special method in our scripts called onGUI. And this is a method that's called at least once per frame, though I think in some cases it can be called multiple times per frame. I'm not sure exactly why, but I, I know that's the case. Anyway, in the method, we're calling static methods of GUI, such as label here to create a text label, a button to create a, a button that we can click, text field to create a text field where we can enter text, and a box, which is just like label, but by default it has a gray 50% uh, transparent background. And these methods all follow a pattern. The first argument is a rect argument. Rect is in rectangle. It's specifying the bounds of where the element is going to be rendered. So here, uh, the first two coordinates, that's the x, y coordinate in screen pixels of the top left of where your element is going to be. So here, 10, 10, that means the top left of our label is 10 pixels from the left of the screen and 10 pixels down from the top of the screen. And then the width is 100 pixels wide and the height is 20 pixels tall. Here for the button, it's 10 pixels from the left of the screen, 70 pixels down, 50 pixels wide, and 30 pixels tall. The second argument to these methods is the content we want to render in the box. In all these cases, it's just a string, but there are other kinds of content. You can nest elements within each other. Like say, you could have buttons and text fields inside your boxes and things of that nature. But for our purposes, we just want to render some strings. And you'll notice that both button and text field are returning values. Label and box return nothing, but button will return true if the button you're creating has been clicked. And this is a little head scratching because we're specifying that the button exists every frame. Every frame we're recreating a thing anew as if it didn't exist before. And yet the IM GUI system seems to somehow retain information about what elements have existed before and what the user is doing with the screen, like say where they're clicking and if there are elements that require keyboard focus like text fields, where that keyboard focus is gonna be. So there's a little bit of magic I don't entirely understand about this IM GUI system because it's not really truly immediate. An immediate mode GUI system is one where the API doesn't retain anything about what our UI looks like from frame to frame. That's up to us to keep track of the state from frame to frame. That's why every called on GUI, which is called at least once a frame, we're effectively recreating the UI each time. And yet somehow it's registering that like say this button 
has been clicked in the same frame where it's being created. And even more mysterious, actually, down here, the text field. Text fields have keyboard focus. So in one frame, you click the thing to give it keyboard focus. But then, but then I think as long as you keep creating that same text field in all the subsequent frames, it's somehow like keeping track of, oh, that thing still has uh, keyboard focus. So that when you type, this is the, the string here we're passing in, which is this, uh, this private field. It's starting out starter text. But then each call to on GUI, we're creating a text field, setting the string that we see in the text field, and then text field returns the string, whether or not it's been modified. So in most frames, the return string here will be the same as the one we pass in. But then in frames where the user has previously given the text field focus and they start typing on the keyboard, they hit letters and spaces and backspaces and so forth, the return string will then reflect that input. It'll reflect those changes. So it's a little funny here because that part of the state, we're keeping track of that ourselves. The GUI system is not keeping track of what text is in the text field. But then the fact that the text field has keyboard focus, somehow the, the system keeps track of that. I, I don't know exactly what's happening. Uh, by the way, here, the, the argument 25, that's just the, the max length that this text field lets you enter. So the return string will be at most 25 characters long. Uh, also note down here for the box, the coordinate we specified for the X, if you want to position something relative to the right side of the screen, we can use screen.width to get the, the width of our, of our game view and then subtract 200 from that. And effectively now, this box is positioned with its top left corner 200 pixels from the right edge of the game view. So anyway, this is called at least once per frame, and each time these method calls are putting these elements on the screen. So if we come here, play the game. And as you can see, the UI elements don't show up in the scene view, they only show up in the game. And over here, this is our label. This is our button. Here I can click it, and every time I do, it's printing out in the console, click the button with text, because in our code, we're checking what button returns. And every time we click the button, the next call to GUI button here will return true. And so that's why this is printing out. And then we have our text field down here. I put keyboard focus on it. And I'm just going to edit the text to whatever I want. And in our code, each time I change the text in the text field, that is what's being returned here and assigned to the text field of our class. And lastly, the box here, as I said, is positioned 200 pixels from the right of the screen. So as I change the width of our game, notice it's just staying 200 pixels from the right of the screen. Anyway, so now we can put some quick and dirty GUI elements on our screen. There are ways in this old system to do more sophisticated layouts, that is positioning of the elements relative to each other and relative to the screen and so forth. You can also change the styling, like say for our box, if we wanted to change what color this background is or whether the corners are rounded or what the border color is, etc., the, and the fonts inside and their sizes and, and their colors. We can do all that. If you're interested, it's described here in the manual under UI and immediate mode GUI. All this other stuff is the, the new system, the canvas-based system we'll talk about later in more detail. But for now, all we care about is that we can put some basic elements on the screen and that'll be handy when demonstrating other features. The vector two type, as we've discussed, is a struct consisting of simply an X value and a Y value, two floats. This struct has a number of interesting properties and methods, which we're going to enumerate here in a minute. But then we have the vector three struct, which of course adds in a third float, the Z component. And this vector three class has all of the same properties and methods, but then it has a few things in addition. And I'm gonna briefly walk you through this as well. Though I don't wanna really go deep in any math here. There's some things that are kind of confusing. Later on, we'll be going into more detail about how these methods and properties might be useful in games, various ways they can be applied. But there's a series of videos on YouTube that I recommend called Math for Game Developers that starts out covering vectors and all the useful things we can do with them. There's also a bunch of other topics, uh, matrices, quaternions, and various other math stuff useful in games. So that's a very useful resource. But for now, I'm just gonna enumerate uh, what's in the Vector2 and Vector3 classes. First off with Vector2, we have these static properties, right, left, up, down, one, and zero. And these are just Vector2 values, which you might commonly use, such as the unit vector pointing in the rightward direction, that is assuming you're facing uh, down the z-axis in the positive direction, the x-axis runs off to the right. So the, so the right unit vector would have the coordinates one and zero and the left unit vector would have the coordinates negative one and zero, up would be zero one, down would be zero negative one. And then one, that's that's not a unit vector because the magnitude is not one, but it's just both components are one, and then there's zero, which is just 
both components are zero. So sometimes it's just a nice shorthand rather than having to write either of these. Understand that the code won't be any more efficient either way. Whether you use these uh, properties or not is really just a matter of style. And then lastly, we have positive infinity, where both components are the special float value representing positive infinity, and negative infinity, where both float components are the special float value representing negative infinity. And then getting into the methods here, uh, assume for all these examples that we have two vector two values, one called A, one called B. And first off, there's an instance method called equals, where it returns true if here A and B are exactly equal. So it's equivalent to just doing this, doing a quality test between their X components, ending that with a quality test between their Y components, exactly the same thing. But then the equality operator is overloaded for vector twos such that it returns true even in some cases where A and B are not exactly equal. There's a little bit of slough where if their difference is less than one E negative five, that's, that's one over 10,000, I believe. Um, yeah, so if it's a very small difference, you still get back true. Otherwise, it'll be false. And then the plus operator returns a vector where the X components have been added together to produce the new X component and the Y components have been added together to produce the new Y component. And the way the, the plus override method is defined is it's commutative. So A plus B returns the same thing as B plus A, same result. And then we have subtraction, which is same deal, except of course we're subtracting rather than adding. But of course, keep in mind, subtraction is not commutative. So it matters whether we're subtracting B from A or A from B. The order changes the result we get. And then we can also use the multiplication operator, but not between two vectors. One of them is a scalar value, just an ordinary number value. And what this does is it produces a new vector where the X component is produced by multiplying the X component of the vector times the scalar and same deal for the Y component. And this is commutative. So A times five is the same as five times A. Likewise, for the division operator, the other operator is just a number. It's a scalar, it's not a vector. So this here is dividing the respective components by five. The difference though, is that this operator is defined only in one direction. So if we try to divide a number by a vector, there's no defined method. And so this is just a compile error. The scale method does actually let us multiply two vectors together, just like we add them and subtract them. So here, when we scale A and B, we get the X component by multiplying the two X components together, and we get the new Y component by multiplying the two Y components together. And then we have a few instance properties, which are read only, such as getting the magnitude of the vector, that is the length, or the square magnitude, where it's the length multiplied by itself, which is useful in some cases because of the way magnitude is computed is that it's actually cheaper to get the square magnitude rather than the actual magnitude because it involves the Pythagorean theorem and that requires getting the square root. Square roots are expensive operations. Anyway, sometimes you want the square magnitude because if you're just comparing the two lengths of two vectors and you just care about the relative length, you probably then would just use the square magnitude because it's cheaper to get than the actual magnitude. Also, we can get the normal of our vector, which is the unit vector that points in the same direction. Unit vector meaning it has a length of one. So we have some vector points in some direction. It has some magnitude, which is not necessarily one, but the normalized property returns is a vector pointing in the same direction, but having a length of one. And then a bit confusingly, there's also the normalized method, which doesn't return a new vector, it actually mutates it. So property returns the normal vector of A, normalize makes A into its normal vector. Lastly here, the vector two type also has about a dozen static methods we can use, including distance, which takes two vector twos, A and B. And this is the same as subtracting B from A and getting the length of that vector. When you subtract vector B from A, you're getting a vector that effectively represents uh, the direction and distance you'd have to travel to get from B to A. And so if we just want the distance between two points, we get the magnitude of this vector. The clamp magnitude method, oops, that really should say A, not X. We have a, some vector two called A, and we wanna get a vector which points in the same direction, but if our vector exceeds the specified length here, we wanna get the vector pointing in the same direction, but which has that length. So say if A here has a length of 10, we'll get back here a vector pointing in the same direction, but which has a length of five. On the other hand, if the magnitude of A, if the length of A were already less than five, we would just get back the same value as A. The max method takes two vectors, A and B, and returns a vector where the X component is the larger of the two X components, and the Y component is the larger of the two Y components. 
And likewise, the min method returns a vector where the x component is the smaller of the two x components and the y component is the smaller of the two y components. Off the top of my head, I can't imagine when this is useful, but I'm sure there are cases where it comes up. And next we have the static angle method, which returns the angle between the two vectors. And the angle returned is expressed in terms of degrees, and it's the absolute angle, so the sign is always positive. And because it's the absolute angle, it doesn't matter the order of the vectors. If it's from A to B or B to A, we get the same angle regardless. Whereas the signed angle method returns the angle in degrees between the two vectors, but it's signed, so it matters if we're getting the angle from A to B, as here, or the angle from B to A. Next, we have the dot method, as in finding the dot product. And the dot product is an operation which is defined as multiplying the respective x components together and multiplying the respective y components together, but then we sum those two products together. So we're getting back a single value, a scalar value, not a vector. So that's how the operation is defined. The interesting question is, why is this useful? Well, we can prove that the dot product of a and b is equal to the magnitude of a multiplied by the magnitude of b multiplied by the cosine of the angle between them. And in fact, this equation is the basis for how we compute the angle between two vectors, which we won't go into here, but understand that's how it's done. And also be clear, dot product is commutative, as you can see here. If we swapped b and a here, we'd get the same result. Moving on, there is the lerp method. Lerp meaning linearly interpolate. And the idea is we have two vectors which effectively represent points in space, right? There, there's this ambiguity between a vector of whether it's a, it's a point in space or it's a, a line from the origin towards that point. It's kind of both at once. Anyway, thinking of our vectors as being points in space, something you would often want to do, particularly in games, is find the points in between some percentage of the way from A to B. And that's what Lerp does. This here is going to return the point which is on the line segment from A to B, but 40% of the way from A towards B. If this were 0.5, it would be halfway between them. If it was 0%, the vector returned would equal A. If this value were 1, that's 100% of the way to B, so the value we get back would be equal to B. And then we have a variation lerp unclamped, which is exactly the same, but it doesn't clamp this value in the range of 0 to 1. So 2.4 effectively represents 240% of the way from A to B. So we've, we've gone past B twice over and then another 40%. Also could even be negative. So you can start at A and move away from B. You can go in the opposite direction if this value is negative. Then we have move towards, which is similar. We're starting at A and we want to find a point on the line segment towards B. But instead of specifying the percentage of how far between them we want to go, we specify how far we want to go in absolute distance. So assuming here that the distance from A to B is 10 units, this call is going to return a vector representing the point on the line segment from A to B that's four units away from A. We've traveled four units from A towards B. If though the distance from A to B is smaller than the value we specify here, then the value we get back is just going to be B. We're traveling from A towards B but we're never going to overshoot. So in this case, say, if the distance from A to B is three units long, well, four overshoots that, but we wouldn't overshoot. Instead, we just get back a vector which is the same as B. Then we have the most complicated method to use called smooth damp, which serves a similar purpose. It returns a point on the line segment between A and B, but here we're specifying a velocity we want to travel from A towards B. We specify a time value, which is in seconds, of how long we want to take to reach the target, to reach B. We can also clamp the speed we're going to travel. We can specify a max speed, which defaults to infinity, so that effectively there is no, no, no max speed. And lastly, we're specifying for this one call, what is the unit of time elapsed? How long are we traveling? So it's how fast we're traveling, and then how long we're actually traveling. And this, by the way, is a special named parameter where you can omit it and it'll default to time.delta time. So if you call it an update, it'll just be whatever the delta time is for that update. Uh, but otherwise, you can specify it explicitly if you want. But the weird thing here is this time to target. This doesn't have any influence on the vector returned, but velocity here is a special kind of parameter called a ref parameter, which in C-sharp means that the value passed in is actually passed by reference and so it can be modified. So smooth damp, yes, it's returning a new vector too, but it's also modifying your velocity. 
and the value it sets your velocity to is dependent on the time to target. The method estimates given how much you're traveling here in this one operation, in this one call, given the remaining distance, what velocity would you need to be traveling at to reach the end target in the specified time? So this one's quite complicated. It's a little involved, but it can sometimes be quite useful because this is a fairly common thing we want to simulate, an object moving from one point to another uh, under acceleration. Lastly, for vector two, we have the reflect method, which returns a vector with the magnitude of A, the same magnitude, but its direction is as if A has been bounced off a surface, or in two dimensions, I should say a line. We don't have surfaces in two dimensions, we have lines. So what line though are we bouncing A off of? Well, it's a line defined by this vector B, where B is its normal, and B must be a unit vector, it must be normalized. Otherwise, you don't get correct results, so make sure it's normalized. And also be clear, this is a little strange, but we don't care where this surface is positioned in space. All that matters is its slope, because it's the slope that determines the direction of the returned vector. And again, the magnitude of the returned vector is always equal to A's magnitude. Here's an illustration of how the reflect method works. We're creating this vector A and B, and then reflecting A off of B, being sure to normalize B, because it's expecting a normalized vector, otherwise you get an incorrect result. So we now have these three vectors and we want to draw them out. First we make A green, then we make B red, and the reflection vector we make magenta. So let's see that in action. And uh, before I hit play here, we're going to want to see the X, Y axis dead on. And we can do that by uh, messing with these buttons here. And I also click the button in the center that switches us to an orthogonal projection. It will look like a, a blueprint cross section of the X, Y axis. Anyway, so hit play here. And I'll hit shift enter to maximize the window. Okay, so green here is the vector A. This little green sphere is just illustrating the origin. I also put that in the scene. And the red line is our vector B. This gets normalized, so you have a vector with the same direction, but with a length of one. And that is used to describe a surface, a line, I should say. We're in two dimensions, so I should say a line uh, that runs perpendicular to this normal. So it runs like this. That is the slope of the line. And so now imagine that our vector A is hitting a line with that slope at this point. So the way the line is described, it doesn't really have a position, it just has a slope. So it's at this point where the contact is made and we bounce off at an inverse angle and that would be like shooting off in this direction because the slope is like here, it's slanted this way. So we would shoot off this way. As you see here, the magenta vector, it has the same magnitude as our vector A and it has the direction of the inverse angle. And to make this clearer here, I'm gonna come back and uncomment this line where we're drawing the reflect vector, but the start and end point are offset by A. So it'll draw starting from the end point of the green line. So save this code, switch back, wait for the code to recompile, and there it is. This is the same vector, just drawn starting from this position rather than from the origin. As you can see, if the slope looked like this, this is bouncing off at the inverse angle. 